We're here with, uh, at AIEMCA with Libby Clark from Charles Sturt University uh, in Albury with Donga to talk about speech pathology. Um, so uh, Libby, could you just tell us a little bit about um, uh, how speech pathology fits in with um, conversation analysis and interactional research? I think that CA has been a huge um, boon, a huge... Um, dis a real potential for um, making great changes in the way speech therapy is um, conducted. So um, for me, personally, um, I was first introduced to um, concepts around CA through Rod Gardner when I was doing a Masters in Linguistics, Applied Linguistics at Melbourne Uni. And it really was one of those awfully proverbial sad moments where you just have a light bulb that goes on in your head and it's like, oh my God, yes, someone is actually talking about interactional competence as separate from or different to, not separate from, but different to linguistic competence. And when you've worked with a lot of clients who have real impairment of their capacity to produce words, to put words together, to produce sound, to make sound intelligible. So when you've had people whose linguistic competence is really compromised and yet you know that they are still a good communicator, mm. it's there was there was nothing in my training that really made that, you know, that dichotomy fit or sit comfortably mm. uh, until I was introduced to CA. And it's really been quite amazing how much work has been done in the last, say, 10 or 15 years by speech therapists, mainly in Europe, um, a little bit in America, very little here in Australia as yet. Um, but it's still not something that's um, really been taken up in a really active way, you know, by a, a broad swathe of the profession. And uh, so we still have our challenges there. So. Your original question was, uh, how does it relate? I, I just think that there's so much power in being able to explore the the way ordinary practice is done. I mean, that's actually most of our clients' aims, is to be good at ordinary interaction. You know, mm -hmm. uh, People who stutter, people who've had a stroke, young kids with lisps, young kids with... Um, autism spectrum disorders who just want to have friends, just want to be able to do ordinary life. And uh, I think that's a really powerful um, first base for it. So what are some of the, the particular things that... Um, so what are some of the particular things that conversation analysis um, has found uh, uh, that has been useful in... Um, Hmm. I think some of the the really powerful one, which I alluded to before, is this idea that even when you have um, a communication impairment, so there is something about an individual's body structure, so maybe they've got a cleft palate, so the structure of their mouth is incomplete, or with body function, so how their language system works or how their memory works. So even when you've got an impairment like that, people are still able to use um, whatever communicative skills they have to um, to achieve meaningful interaction with other people. So it's been a lot. In fact, I'd actually say that to date there's been a real, um, maybe the majority of CA work in speech pathology has been around showing the competence um, being a, showing how people, even people who are non-verbal, um, who are not able to talk, but still are able to communicate effectively. And I think Charles Goodwin's work um, uh, with Chuck and his ability to only say yes, no and and has just been a magnificent example of how people uh, can interact. So that ability to still... Um, either to retain or to simply have. I mean, even young children who are non-verbal um, are still able to use various mechanisms, uh, turn-taking mechanisms. Um, the, the, the idea of structure, you know, still can come into um, 
the non-verbal interaction that they have with other people. And so you can, I, I really do, I've come to really feel that there is a much deeper kind of interactional competence over which we, you know, overlay uh, a linguistic competence. So maybe you can edit that out if you fancy. <laughs> but, um, so yes, yeah, so that's one of the things, that interactional competence. Two is sh showing us very clearly what strategies people use in their, um, to manage their own um, errors. So... Um, how our capacity to self-repair, to be aware of the need to repair, really says a lot about people's orientation to um, the co-constructed, um, shared understanding of, of what's going on moment by moment. Um, I think that the, the work that Sarah Locke and uh, Ray Wilkinson and, and others have done around actually using those video recorded examples um, to, in effect, train, support... So it is really training interactional partners to be more aware of patterns of repair or patterns of interaction that are reducing the capacity of the person with the impairment to participate. So often, in my experience as a therapist, working with people who've had a stroke, you'll get patterns which people think are really helpful, you know, like filling in the word, you know, um, when the person can't think of it, or changing topic when, say, someone who stutters uh, is getting really, you know, our awkwardness at that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so we tend to shy away from it. So, but, but when we actually look at those patterns with the interaction partners, so looking at them and, and getting them to sort of talk about and think about, what might be other ways to do things. Possibly a little bit, if you like, reminiscent maybe of um, Elizabeth Stocko's talk on around her role-playing, but this is, not, this is actually people looking at their own talk and, and identifying strategies or patterns that they might choose to change or do differently. And, and that actually has been really powerful. And uh, I know that Sarah Locke has gone on to use a similar kind of approach with young um, adolescents with um, Asperger's syndrome and getting them to actually really look at their own interaction patterns and and make just little changes, you know, because I think that's the other power of CA is to show us that it doesn't have to be big to make a difference. It actually can be just a little change that really can bring about quite a different um, pattern of interaction. So... Um, so I think that those are the things that really stand out for me. The um, CA really helps us to, to see competence uh, where the focus has been on impairment, mm. but impairment doesn't, you know, isn't the whole picture. You know, you have impairment and competence. And that we can actually use that data to encourage a shift or, or a change in, in patterns of interaction.